Now is the time for coming together. Here is the place we meet as community. Together, our gathering makes this time, this place, holy. Let us worship the one who has called us now, here, together. Some introductory words. I was last here on the 1st of March 2020 when I took a service on why we pray. I remember nothing about my journey from York to Newcastle, but I do remember my journey back home. Diagonally opposite and a few rows in front of me were a group of people sitting together. One of them spent the whole time he was on the train coughing quite loudly. And I remember being worried about catching something, possibly COVID, from him. February the 28th of that year was when the first case of illness was transmitted within the UK, rather than being brought into the country. And March the 4th was when there was the first surge of cases within the UK from 34 to 87. I have often wondered, did that man have undiagnosed COVID? I will never know. Some words by Jimmy Timoney, again, a Yorkshire Unitarian. As we light a long chalice, we think about what this light means. It represents the light within ourselves and the light within others, threads of the universal light of love. Our first reading is one I've written. It's my memories and thoughts comparing then and now at both my own home church of York and here in Newcastle. I moved to York in 1972 when I started teaching. Is it coming up all right? Yes. It's right. I was born Unitarian, and my grandparents, also Unitarians, lived in York and worshipped at the York Unitarian Church. I was only a young person. I was 23 at the time, and I don't think there was anyone in the congregation below the age of 50 or possibly 60. We had a small electric electronic organ which contributed to a particular oddity which made our services unique and I'm afraid not unique in a nice way. There was a taxi firm opposite our chapel and the organ was somehow linked to the taxi, uh, taxi firm. Very awkward and disturbing to hear taxi needed at such and such an address in the middle of a reading or in, even worse during the sermon. I don't remember how the problem was fixed, but it did happen for some months, I remember that. Some of you may wonder what persuaded me to continue worshipping there. It's very simple. I had lived in Halifax, or near Halifax, as a uh, young girl, well, as a teenager, and Halifax for a time had a, um, a Welsh minister who had a family. I've forgotten his name, but we got involved, the children, his children, and me and my sister, we got involved in the Yorkshire Unitarian Union of Young People's League, and, and that meant so much to me. It, really helped me. I, I grew in involvement. Um, I learned a lot working and leading uh, as a group. Uh, we were in charge of our own activities then rather than being taught by somebody else. So we, we led ourselves and that group had uh, Gerald Whitaker, some of you might remember him, um, Hazel and David Warhurst, who of course you, uh, a lot of you will know, at myself, uh, my sister, who was not really involved in Unitarianism now, and um, oh, Jill Whitaker, who was uh, um, Gerald Whitaker's sister. 
So quite a lot of people who are still involved in Unitarianism now, unfortunately, Gerald Whitaker died a few years ago, but still. I gained, as I said, so much in personal development as a member of the Yorkshire Unitarians. And from early stays at Great Hucklow, and my Unitarian faith was, and still is, so important to me. I had to continue worshipping there, and I still do. Uh, about 50, near, very nearly 50 years later, I've been a, um, an active member of the congregation for all that time. I first attended here, this church, when Hazel and David got married. And that, where they had the golden wedding anniversary, I think it was last year, I was talking to Hazel recently, and she told me how brilliant the people here made the, uh, the service for them, the memorial, so, so, the Sunday service nearest to their wedding anniversary. And she's really impressed. I'm afraid I can't remember anything of the church from that occasion. I remember, well, I remember they got married and that's all that oh, I can remember. When I first started leading worship here, I think it was two, sometime in 2018, maybe a bit earlier than that, I'm not quite sure. I was sent into the, well, shown into the, the vestry over there. I stayed there, hidden away until the service was due to start and Morris uh, um, came and brought me out. And I felt so self-conscious. I'm not a person who likes that type of formality. And that happened for most of the services until I persuaded people to stop taking me anywhere. But uh, certainly it did start, uh, it did happen for my first few services here. I was expecting today to be downstairs. So that was going to be the now of the Newcastle sort of comparisons. Instead, we're actually back up here in the church, which I must admit, I do like. I like the stained glass windows, even though they're very, very simple. I love the colors in your windows here. So then and now. I've only seen, this is from the Zoom attenders at um, uh, Edinburgh. I've only seen your church in Edinburgh once, and that was only from the outside. But I do know that your loss of Andrew and Margaret Hill has been to York's great advantage. Uh, sorry, Edinburgh, I don't think we're giving you back, them back to you. Now, let us join together in prayer. We are all products of our upbringing. We carry our past with us, but we must understand that as we age, we change. Our interests, our friends, our beliefs may all be very different from when we were younger. Some of us may have maintained a core of close friends that have hardly changed at all, but that will not be all of us. Especially if we've had to move much because of work. So now, please spend a few moments thinking, first of all, about old friends who you may not see anymore, now think about old friends who you do still see and new friends. Thank them for their friendship in your mind. We will all have had good and bad times in our past. May we now remember one or two of the sad or bitter times. Think about what you learned from that event and how you have grown and developed from it or from them. Think now about one or two of the especially good times in your life. Think about the people involved or the place or activity that made them special. Now, 
Please think of the now of your life. Every day is a new now. Try to live each day with compassion and understanding of others and of yourself. Try to be the best person you can be. Amen. I am a person, not a pet. I understand there is no need to stroke me. I hate the way you used my Christian name before you even asked or knew me. I do not want to be another Lucy, Jane or Emma, an entity in a crowd of first named women. I am Mrs. Brown and proud to bear his name. Perhaps when I have chosen my few friends, we can embark upon a closer understanding beneath these shabby genteel clothes. I am an entity that has been built up year by year by joys and sorrows, work and play, responsibility, experience, love. I am the little girl who wandered in the primrose wood. I am the girl whose French was weak, but always passed exams who loved geography and wallowed in a wealth of words. I am the student whose college days were rich with friends, philosophy, ideals, new thoughts. I am the woman who was wife and mother, who knew the splendor of a family bound with love, but also knew the heartbreak and the passing from baby wants to teenage needs and pressures of loss, an irreplaceable companion. I am the traveller who slept on mountain tops, who braved the Arctic seas of the North Cape. I am the wife who loved to cook and clean, whose house was filled with friends who came to talk, to walk, to put the world aright. I am a person. I am me, not dear. By Margaret Ridley. Uh, the second reading I chose by Judith, Judith Crompton. I chose it because it seemed to fit in with the time that we're living in, the fact that all of you are wearing masks of one sort or another. This is not talking about the, the physical uh, material masks or paper masks, but it still mentions masks. We have passed beyond the point of no return. We have gazed into each other's eyes, maskless and without fear. The maskless moment said, I know you, I love you. So do not mourn the passing of the days of joy as we take our journey. Like minds are always there at the end of the journey to greet us arriving. And the fond spirits of those who love us well can never leave us, but stay in our hearts forever. Two quite different readings. We now have a playlet, which I hope is going to work all right. Uh, I've got um, Diana, Ben and Jean, who have been either coerced or volunteered. When I were a child, we had no car. We had to go everywhere by bus. How demeaning. By bus? You were lucky. When I were a child, there were no buses where we lived. We had to walk for two miles, then catch the bus for the final mile. When I were a child, we couldn't afford no buses. We had to walk. 
walk, you were lucky. When I was a child, we had to tiptoe slowly past the bomb craters, fighting our fear all the time. Walk? Did you have shoes? When I were a child, a pair of shoes had to last a year, and if they got a hole, a piece of cardboard filled it up. Shoes? My shoes were always passed down from my cousin. They were always worn out before I got them. Shoes? You were lucky. I had to wear thin slippers all year round. That's why my toes froze off. Shoes? You were lucky. I didn't wear shoes until I came here. I walked everywhere on bare feet. My mother and grandmother made all my clothes. Dresses that were never fashionable and knitted vests that reached my knees. And then they were always passed on to my cousin. Clothes? I am your cousin. I hated wearing your dresses and vests. All my friends thought I were a girl until I were 10. At least you had a relative to pass clothes on to you. My mum got all my clothes from the local jumble sale. Clothes? You were lucky. My clothes were always barely decent and usually too small or too big. Talk about clothes. Do you remember wash day? Mum with the dolly tub and the old mango to squeeze out the water. You had a mango. You were lucky. Me and my brother had to twist and squeeze wet clothes between us. You were lucky. We had to wash our clothes on our bodies during our monthly wash in the hip bath in the backyard. Well, you were lucky. The nearest water was over a mile away. We kids would walk to get it. Water was only used for cooking and drinking. We would get washed in the rainy season. I'm afraid I forgot. I had intended to give Diana an Indian shawl to wear over her head, but to, anyhow, I hope that all uh, was fine for you. This short sketch was based on one called Four Yorkshiremen, written by Tim Brooke Taylor, John Cleese, Graham Chapman, and Marty Feldman which was first performed in 1967. It was later performed by Monty Python. Our little playlet was a mixture of truth and imagination. My words were mostly true and were based on my childhood in Harrogate and Elland in the West Riding. I did wear handmade or knitted clothes, but they had enough growing room in them that I usually wore them out and if any were passed on, it would be to my sister, not a cousin. And I do remember having cardboard in my shoes. Uh, I particularly remember, and this always makes me feel a bit disgusted, uh, about attending Sunday school at the local Methodist church. I wanted to go to Brownies and then guides. And to attend the brownies or guides, you had to attend the Sunday school. Now, I wasn't a Methodist. I'd never been a Methodist. Um, and anyhow, I went to Sunday school and there we were in our little rows and a kid behind me noticed that I'd got cardboard in my shoe and I got teased horribly. It was a dry day, so it had been okay. Uh, it was the end of the summer holidays nearly. I'd got new shoes to wear for the start of the new term. They always pinched, they always hurt, and I always used to get blisters at the start of term for a week or so. I wasn't allowed to walk them in before the, or wear them in before the start of the new term. That's my then about shoes. <laughs> ben and Jean spoke words that were mostly imaginary but based on lives in the past. Diana's words were partly based on someone living in a war-torn country, but also based on children and have met in the past uh, in Bangladesh, India, and Uganda. 
Um, I went to Uganda most recently, and I remember seeing a little boy there who had, well, if I'd looked carefully, I'm sure I could have seen anything of uh, importance in his physique. Uh, his clothes were very, very, very worn out. Uh, terrible. And he was sniveling. He was, I mean, his clothes were not only worn out, uh, they were filthy. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in India, in Northeast India, where there are a lot of Unitarians. And one friend, I, a young woman I became friendly with, I actually went with her to where the, in the dry season, where there was permanent water, and uh, it was a dry season then, so they didn't have water to the houses. So she actually put the empty um, uh, aluminium water container on my back, and I carried it empty for a short distance. It's about a quarter of a mile, maybe a bit more than that from their house to where the water the reservoir was. She carried it all the way back, not me. The now of many people in the world is still very disadvantaged compared to my then. I've walked, as I've already told you, I've walked the approximately quarter of a mile to collect water. I've also seen clothes being washed in rivers and stretched to, die, to dry over bushes. I've also washed under a wrap in a stream with a friend, this was in India, whilst a neighbour collected water upstream of us. That neighbour was male and I did feel rather self-conscious. So that again, that was only 2013, so it's not that long ago. I studied zoology, botany and chemistry at university. I went on to teach biology and chemistry. When I started teaching, we taught that plastics were a type of solid, useful for classification. We also taught how crude oil was fractionally distilled and how different fractions were used to make petrol, diesel and plastics. Plastics were seen as new wonder substances, not as the pollutants of the oceans as they are now known to be. Just last week, I was down visiting a very dear friend who I've known for about 50 years. There on her table was an old Tupperware beaker. It made us both think how special Tupperware was and how long lived it is. I still have a large Christmas or wedding cake. I'm calling it tin, it's, it's made of plastic, it's a Tupperware uh, container, but my mother got it as a Christmas present from my aunt, another Unitarian lady, and I remember looking at that and thinking, I want to inherit that, and I did, and I still use it. Anyhow, I looked in my kitchen cupboard, I knew I had uh, two storage containers that were Tupperware, there they were, but then I found this. I found this lid. I've no idea why I've kept it. I couldn't certainly in that cupboard find a round plastic container that that would fit. So when I go home, I will actually throw this away. But this is Tupperware and there it is stamped with its name. For those of you who don't know about Tupperware, you had parties, Tupperware parties. And uh, we never had one where I lived. So um, we never got any new Tupperware, uh, well, other than gifts from family members. But, so this has been given somehow, somewhere, somewhere, I don't know. But apparently Tupperware is still available and you can still have Tupperware parties. So I think it's coming up to its 70th birthday and there's going to be a giant Tupperware party to celebrate. Um, you need to check the facts of the day. So yes. <laughs> I remember lecturers wondering about the future availability of coal, oil and natural gas. What would we use for energy production in the future? Pollution was seen as mainly a product of soaps and other chemicals produced by the mills in industrial towns. And I certainly remember Elland had a lot of mills and there tended to be froth and foam on the river. And uh, 
uh, those of course would kill the aquatic invertebrates and even fish. And I remember the soot uh, from the mill chimneys. Elland, where I grew up, was uh, the most industrialised town of its size in Europe. There were more mills in Elland than any other town of comparable population size. So there were a lot of chimneys and a lot of very, very black buildings. I grew up thinking stone was black, not pale fawn, because all the buildings, particularly the, um, the walls of, uh, well, out in the countryside even, uh, the walls of uh, homes, anything that was stone was always black. I thought that was natural. I was also, as a teacher, aware of this soot creating evolutionary change. Melanism in moths. Some of you might remember the term. Yes, there's a few nods going on. Uh, melanism is where a very simple evolutionary change causes the paler spots on moth wings to turn dark. And so the moths are, more, are better camouflaged on the bark of trees. Then I taught that air contained about 20% oxygen, 69% nitrogen, and only 320 parts per million of carbon dioxide, a very tiny amount. Now, scientists know the carbon dioxide levels have increased by more than 20% in less than 40 years. I say, well, 320 parts per million is not very much to start with, but they've increased to about 410 parts per million. And unfortunately, carbon dioxide is the gas that greatly absorbs heat energy. And that's why it's so much more damaging than the oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere. This increase in carbon dioxide is causing global warming and scientists are very, very worried. It's in the news all the time. Everybody, I think, is, is worried. When I was younger, some scientists advised British people to look forward to the effects of global warming, as we, this country, would develop a Mediterranean-type climate at the expense of the Med. That didn't seem to bother scientists particularly back then which would become too hot. So Britain would become the place to spend your summer holidays. A certain amount, certain amount of prophecy there where people are having to have staycation holidays, but for different reasons than global warming. This summer, there has been the other prediction by other scientists of uh, heavy storms, strong winds, and heavy flooding. Uh, so some scientists predicted Great Britain would have gorgeous, lovely Mediterranean weather. Others said, no, it's actually going to be uh, not anywhere near as pleasant. This year we've had uh, fires in uh, many countries near the Mediterranean, uh, forest fires, moorland fires. Uh, there's also been unpredictable storms and flooding uh, in this country and others. So weather is certainly a lot less predictable. So then carbon dioxide increases were not seen as anything to worry about. Now towns and cities are desperately trying to become carbon neutral. One aspect of then and now that is particularly interesting to me is the idea of women working or being a housewife. My mother taught domestic science. And I remember in one book she inherited from her head of department, it talked about the wife directing the servants who could range from a living maid to a girl who just came in to do the washing and ironing. Later, the same book directed the young wife to always make sure that she looked attractive for her husband coming home from work with the house spotless and warm slippers and a cup of tea waiting for him. A book from 1935. 
So a book from 1935 suggest, suggested. This is the, the young wife's timetable. Monday, clean the living room, preparation for the wash. Tuesday, wash day. Wednesday, bedrooms. Thursday, bathroom, lavatory, stairs, pantry, larder and cupboards. Friday, kitchen and scullery. Saturday, landing, hall, stairs, all lighting fittings, electric lamps, etc. Yard, steps, preparation for Sunday. I think on Sunday you're allowed to have a rest or go to church. And then on cleaning, for the living room, it said, note, fire to be done before all else. This applies to bedrooms also. If weekly clean, remove and dust all ornaments and movable bits of furniture, cover rest with dust sheets, take down pictures, roll up curtains, etc. Sweep carpet, see directions page six, dust and polish surrounds, dust room, wash ornaments, dust and polish furniture, wipe down pictures, replace. If daily clean, fire, carpet, floor and dust. And it carries on like that for um, the rest of the paper, well, rest of the house really. So that's a book from 19... 35. Now, this book is 1948, which is the year before I was born, and of course soon after the end of the Second World War. And it therefore talks about the home and the homemaker and relates it to the nation. If we look up the meaning of the word home in a dictionary, we find it is defined as a dwelling place. A home is much more than this, and it's the duty of the housewife or homemaker, and it should be her joy to make home a place of comfort, happiness, and health, and to see that her family is cared for by every means in her power. She herself should enjoy her work, and not allow it to overtire her. In considering a home, we think of the family, which is the basis of the nation. If therefore the nation is to be healthy, both bodily and mentally, a big responsibility rests with the homemaker. And it then carries on with a, a housewife and her responsibilities. This was not the home life that I grew up in. My mother taught full time, so my sister and I were latchkey kids, walking to and from school. I also became a teacher, as is my daughter now, definitely in the genetics, I think. Housework just gets done for both me and my daughter. Is life easier now or was it better in our youth? This is the few older people here uh, asking really that question to them. I won't resort to teacher mode and ask you to put your hands up, but many people do think that life was perhaps not easier, but certainly not as stressful when they were, when they were younger. No mobile phones, no Google, no trolling or cyberbullying. But we can't go backwards. So may we all work to make the now of our lives as good as possible. Amen. We now should have some music played by Asa from St. Mark's. Hello, everyone. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, fabulous. So I'm going to play you the second movement of Mozart Sonata in F.
was lovely, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, some, some su uh, superior being is uh, obviously thinking in the same, same lines. I brought a CD with me, the one CD I have of Mozart's music, and I had suggest, I sort of thought, well, if there are any problems, we could play track <clears throat> five on this, which is Piano Sonata in A minor. It was so much nicer having it played on the piano, so thank you very much. Now, a meditation, it's a meditation in summer, and it is quite a summery day today, so these are words by Arthur Brown. In the silence of this summer morning, let us recall all those other summers of our lives and be thankful for their memory. Let us recall those with whom we shared them, some long gone and some with us still. Let us be thankful for the love and life and the companionship and laughter that they brought us and bring to us still. May we be able to feel that we brought our share of fellowship to those times. Let us resolve to continue to do, do so through all the other summer days of our lives. But we have memories also of more difficult times, of darkness, of winter, and the icy winds that caused our bones to ache and our souls to shrivel, and of how we and our companions, our friends and our loved ones, lived through and overcame whatever ills were our portion. May the memory of those tribulations, those endurances, those victories of the spirit, help us face whatever is left to us of winter. There is at least one lesson for us in our memories, and it is this, that love could make summer out of the worst of winter, and that summer without love is cold and joyless. May we feel that love, that love, sorry, the love that there is between us here, that there has always been here in this community and Edinburgh in their community. May we resolve to keep the flame of love forever burning in our hearts. Um. Our worship draws to a close. The chalice flame is extinguished. Though the light of the candle shines no more, we rejoice in the light of the season and praise the glory of the summer sun. Amen.